Okay, we're going to start our ceremonials. We're going to start with the Celiac Disease Center. So if the folks from the center want to come up, uh, Dr. Peter Green, Green Cynthia, Beckman. Cynthia Beckman, and Julia Hakim. Hello, welcome. Thanks for being here. Pleasure, Corey. Nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you. Okay. Julia, nice to meet you. So uh, this uh, ceremonial is going to be presented by the chair of our health committee, Councilmember Mark Levine, and the chair of our finance committee, Councilmember uh, Danny Drum. It's going to honor and observe May as Celiac Disease Awareness Month and the Celiac Disease Center at Columbia University uh, that has done so much great work in helping people fighting this autoimmune disorder, which affects one in 100 people worldwide. In addition to treating this disease, they work hard to do outreach and educate the public and the medical community so that fewer cases go undiagnosed. So today we're going to honor the Celiac Disease Center at Columbia University for its extraordinary work in celiac disease research, treatment, and education. And before I turn it over uh, to uh, these folks, so we're going to read the proclamation. Council, City of New York Proclamation. In observance of May as Celiac Disease Awareness Month, the New York City Council is proud to honor a nationally and internationally recognized institution that continues to provide the highest quality, compassionate patient care for children and adults with celiac disease, the Celiac Disease Center at Columbia University. And whereas, celiac disease is a serious autoimmune disorder that can occur in genetically predisposed people where the injection, the ingestion of gluten leads to damage in the small intestine. It is estimated to affect one in 100 people worldwide. Two and, a, two and one half million Americans are undiagnosed and are at risk for long-term health complications. And whereas, when people with celiac disease eat gluten, their body mounts an immune response that attacks the small intestine. These attacks lead to damage on the villi, small finger-like projections that line the small intestine and promote nutrient absorption. When the villi get damaged, nutrients cannot be absorbed properly into the body. And whereas the Celiac Disease Center at Columbia University Medical Center is one of the few centers in the United States that provide comprehensive medical care, including nutrition for adult and pediatric patients with celiac disease, and is diagnosing and treating thousands of patients annually from around the world. And whereas the Celiac Disease Center's strengths in research and treatment are enhanced by its location within Columbia University Medical Center, which, as a leading medical institution in New York City, provides fertile ground for innovative research and translational studies across a variety of divisions, departments, centers, and institutes. As a center in the Department of Medicine at Columbia University, the Celiac Disease Center is able to take advantage of many opportunities for interdisciplinary patient care and research. And whereas under the leadership of Peter H.R. Green, MD, who has served as director since 2001, the Celiac Disease Center has excelled at everything from medical consultation, nutritional assessments and counseling, and endoscopy to pathology, genetic testing, patient advocacy, and a wide range of groundbreaking clinical research. These activities combined with successful treatment outcomes for its patients have enabled the Celiac Disease Center to great, greatly impact the rate of diagnosis and awareness among physicians across the country. And whereas the Celiac Disease Center's outreach and education efforts continue to raise awareness about celiac disease and to educate others in the medical community so that each year fewer cases go undiagnosed. To educate the public, the center's physicians have been featured widely in the media. The center has developed educational materials about the disease, conducts annual education event, educational events, and family screening programs and organizes conferences for physicians, nutritionists, and other healthcare practitioners. Now, therefore, be it known that the New York City Council gratefully honors the Celiac Disease Center at Columbia University for its extraordinary work in celiac disease research, treatment, and education. Corey Johnson, speaker for the entire council. Mark D. Levine, chair, committee on health. Daniel Drum, chair, committee on finance. Congratulations. I want to, uh, before I hand it off to you all, I want to uh, allow the council members to say a few words, and then we'd love to hear from you. Councilmember Drum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, this is Celiac Awareness Month. A lot of people do not know what celiac disease is all about. So I'm honored today to have 
the Celiac Disease Center at Columbia University, represented by Dr. Peter Green, Cynthia Beckman, and Julia Hakim, here with us today to um, talk about celiac disease and to make people more aware of it. And I think the awareness is a big part of the problem. A lot of people think that celiac disease is a fad, or people just decide to go gluten-free. What are glutens? Glutens are wheat, barley, um, oats, rye, and uh, oftentimes foods can be contaminated just by being on the same grill or in the same oil, and so it creates a huge problem. My own mother had a celiac disease, and one time a friend of hers gave her a little, little, little piece of cookie, and she ate it without thinking, and she went into a terrible uh, vomiting and, and, and violent reaction to having ingested that small little piece of wheat. So when I learned of the center at Columbia University, I said that we have to do something during this month to bring awareness to it. And that's what today is all about, is making people aware that celiac disease exists and that people really suffer from this disease. In fact, and this is uh, uh, before I turn it over to uh, Council Member Levine, the chair of the health committee, um, when my mother had her heart attack, she passed away on October 4th, but when she had her heart attack, I thought she was having a reaction to celiac. That's how violent sometimes the reaction to celiac can be. And so we're very grateful that you're here and we're very grateful that you're making people aware of this disease. Uh, Council Member Levine. Thank you, well said, uh, Council Member Drum, and thank you, Mr. Speaker, so much for giving us this chance. Anyone who cares about this disease needs to watch the video of, of Chair Drum in last Friday's Finance Committee hearing. Uh, we had our oversight of the Health Department budget, and he was absolutely brilliant and fearless in pushing the commissioner on this. Um, I think he would have done the community very proud uh, for uh, his leadership on this. And uh, so much has been said, I'll just briefly say that it's hard to think of another disease which has so many people who suffer from it who don't know it. And it's estimated to be in the millions nationally, certainly in the tens of thousands in New York City. That's a problem we can solve. We can solve it through awareness and education. Everyone needs to get screened who's at risk so we can get a diagnosis. And then we as a city need to do more, and this is something Danny has been very strong on, to make sure that when you walk into a restaurant, you know whether or not you are at risk for getting glutens. And we're not up to the standards we should be. And we're going to continue to work with you as a council uh, to make sure that we achieve that highest standard. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker and Councilman, uh, on behalf of the Celiac Center at Columbia University, I'd like to thank you for the proclamation, the bill, and everything that you're doing. Because as you mentioned, celiac disease is very common and very much underdiagnosed. And then when people uh, are diagnosed, the only current treatment is a gluten-free diet. And this is a very socially isolating and restrictive diet. While it's a trend that many people are adopting, um, it saves the lives of people with celiac disease. So um, on behalf of the center, again, I appreciate uh, the interest in the disease because uh, only a few years ago, this was labeled as a rare disease. And um, in the lists maintained by the CDC, um, and it's only with the research that we and others have done has shown that it affects in about, about one in 100 people. So if you know 100 people, you should know one person, you did. If you know 200, you probably don't know the second person as yet. So it's much underdiagnosed, and I think efforts from the City Council will improve awareness and, most importantly, improve the quality of life of individuals. Because we diagnose this and then subject people to a very restrictive diet and the diet then becomes the greatest burden. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for all the work you do. Thank you for being here. Thanks for all the work you do. Thank you. Uh, next up, we're going to ask uh, Councilmember Mark Joni to come up.
And we are going to now recognize May as Childhood Apraxia Awareness Month. This is an extremely challenging, uh, if folks who are here for that want to come up, this is an extremely challenging speech disorder that affects thousands of children in New York City. And without appropriate speech therapy intervention, these children suffer when it comes to reading, writing, and other skills once they reach school. It is through the commitment and dedication of their parents and caretakers and researchers and policymakers, however, to bring awareness to this disorder and early intervention that will eventually lead them to succeed. So for that, we observe May as Childhood Apraxia Awareness Month. And I want to uh, ask the, the clerk to please read the proclamation, and then I'm going to hand it over to Council Member Jonah. Council City of New York Proclamation. Whereas the New York City Council is proud to observe the month of May as Childhood Apraxia Awareness Month to help raise awareness throughout the five boroughs about this extremely challenging speech disorder in children. And whereas Childhood Apraxia of Speech causes children to have significant difficulty learning to speak and is among the most severe speech deficits in children. And whereas while the act of learning to speak comes effortless, effortlessly to most children, those with apraxia, apraxia endure an incredible and lengthy struggle. Without appropriate speech therapy intervention, children with apraxia are placed at high risk for secondary impacts in reading, writing, spelling, and other school-related skills. And whereas most, most children with apraxia of speech will learn to communicate with their very own voices only if they receive early intervention, appropriate, intensive, and frequent speech therapy. And whereas it is imperative that there be greater public awareness about childhood apraxia of speech in New York City among community members, physicians, education professionals, policymakers, and elected officials. And whereas funders such as insurance providers, schools, and policymakers are encouraged to recognize the critical need to provide adequate speech therapy and other services so that the impact of this disorder are minimized and so that thousands of effective children can grow into productive, contributing adult citizens. And whereas our highest respect goes to the children as well as, well as their families for their effort, determination, and resilience in the face of such obstacles. Through our shared commitment, we can strengthen support systems for children with childhood apraxia of speech so they have the best opportunity to learn to speak. Now, therefore, be it known that the New York City Council hereby proclaims the month of May to be Apraxia Awareness Month in New York City and encourages everyone to increase their awareness and understanding of childhood apraxia of speech. Corey Johnson, speaker for the entire council. Mark Joe Nye, council member, 13th District, Bronx. Thank you very much. I want to hand it over to Councilmember Joni before we hear from some of the, the folks that are here today. Thank you, Speaker. You know, uh, there are one in 12 children suffer from some type of speech disorder. And today's action by the City Council will recognize this entire month for some incredible children, moms and dads and families that have come together to bring public awareness to something that goes undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and unfortunately requires a tremendous amount of th therapy. Um, I just want to share with you that with us we have Christopher and Damien. <laughs> He's a natural, and I, I. They were both diagnosed at an early age and both families were not able to get the information on how to deal with the challenges. And they, they worked really hard. This past September, um, Damien was able to say his name out loud. And maybe you'll help us out, Damien, by saying your name. Damien. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll share another fantastic story about Christopher where there's a deli, a special deli in the borough of the Bronx uh, at Bosco's that actually named a sandwich after Christopher called the Little Giant. <laughs> and it's a grilled sandwich with bacon, American cheese, mayonnaise, and ketchup. <laughs> so, uh, I wanna thank you and all of the colleagues and the city council for helping promote this uh, speech disorder that affects so many 
and I'm grateful to the parents, and I'm grateful in particular to Megan, who brought this to my attention, has formed her own not-for-profit, promoting the good work that she's done and making sure that families are better informed. So thank you. Thank you, Megan, and thank you to all the other families, and thank you, Damien and Christopher. We just want to thank um, Councilman Mark Jonai and everybody else for spreading awareness about apraxia, um, which is a neurological speech disorder where the child knows what they want to say, but when they go to say it, they have trouble coordinating their muscle movements and the muscles required to make like, clear speech sounds. Um, and it's important to have awareness because I know when my son was first diagnosed, it was hard for me to know what to do. And before that, I was also told a lot of times by even doctors, other parents, like your child's just a late talker, they'll talk when they're ready, um, and sometimes it's more than that. So it's important for parents to know that there's resources available in their city, and their community, and people to reach out to and just find the right information about it. Yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, we're so excited to be here, and I also wanted to add to what Megan said is that it's so important for us to be able to spread awareness and be able to create programs because our sons have that challenge of not speaking well. Um, some kids are, who don't speak are seen as, well, they can't function, they can't learn. Um, we've been blessed for the past nine years to be able to find a school for Chris where he's able to do math, do reading, comes home, works on science, and he's had so much accomplishment in nine years and it's all because of the work that we've been doing to push to make sure that everybody all over the world, because Kasana, the organization that Megan and I belong to, does that. There are so many families in our community who are not aware that we are supporters, that we, they're not alone, and this day is very important to us. Because when we, as mothers, Stand here, stand here, we say, our sons are already somebody. It's so beautiful. Thank you so much. It's so nice to have you. Hi, so nice to have you here. Thank you. No, thank you. You're awesome, thank you. So let's get a photo together with everyone. Congratulations. Thank you all so much. Thanks for being here today. Welcome to City Hall. A pleasure. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Welcome. So next up, we are going to call up and Majority Leader Cumbo is going to present the next uh, proclamation and ceremonial. We are calling up Leslie Schultz. Yay! If Leslie and the Brick family want to come up. Awesome. That's amazing. That's great. When is it? June 5th. <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> Hi. A pleasure. Welcome. Welcome. Awesome. Come on up. Stand right over here. Amazing. Come on up. So we are, everyone, come on up. Don't be shy. Come on up. Come on up. Both sides. Both sides. So we are really proud to honor Leslie Schultz for her amazing service 
and contributions as the president of BRIC, providing free cultural programming in Brooklyn and as a supporter of Brooklyn artists and media influencers under her leadership. She was able to promote and amplify the stories that benefit the artists and community at large, as well as opening an arts and media complex, which has become a staple of the entire borough and of our city. Her impact to this community and for the entire city is deeply profound and she has distinguished herself as a powerhouse in this role. We are sad to see her go, but we wish her the best of luck in her future endeavors. And before I call on the majority leader to make a few comments, I'm gonna ask the clerk to please read the proclamation. Council, City of New York proclamation. The New York City Council is proud to honor Leslie G. Schultz upon her departure for her 12 years as the visionary president of BRIC the leading presenter of free cultural programming in Brooklyn, and a major incubator and supporter of Brooklyn artists and media makers. And whereas Ms. Schultz's leadership as president has enabled BRIC's extraordinarily dedicated, talented, and creative staff and its tireless board of directors to expand the reach of the organization to promote access to arts and media for all. Her work has provided meaningful support for artists and media makers and amplified voices and stories that benefit both the creators and the community at large. And whereas when Ms. Schultz arrived at BRIC in 2005, the organization consisted primarily of three loosely affiliated programs, the Celebrate Brooklyn Performing Arts Festival at the Prospect Park Bandshell, the Rotunda Gallery in Brooklyn Heights, and Brooklyn Community Access Television, BCAT. And whereas 12 years ago, BRIC had annual operating revenues of 3.7 million and 2 million in long-term investments. Today, BRIC has annual operating revenues of 15.8 million and long-term investments of $17 million, and the size of BRIC staff has more than doubled. And whereas in 2013, under her leadership, BRIC opened BRIC House, a 40,000 square foot arts and media complex that brings BRIC's year-round programs together under one roof and attracts 100,000 visitors each year. The facility includes two performance spaces, one of which doubles as a town hall meeting space, a major contemporary art exhibition space, a program room for small-scale contemporary art exhibitions, a glass wall television studio where Brick TV, the award-winning Brooklyn-focused cable and digital network, films and broadcasts, and a state-of-the-art public access media center. And whereas while at the helm of BRIC, Ms. Schultz also co-founded and provided leadership to two new major arts organizations, the Downtown Brooklyn Arts Alliance, consisting of 39 local arts organizations, and the new coalition of culturals in city-owned buildings. Upon her departure, Ms. Schultz has helped usher BRIC into its 40th anniversary year with, in, and into a very bright future. She truly distinguished herself in this role, and we wish her continued success in all of her future endeavors. Now, therefore, be it known that the New York City Council gratefully honors Leslie G. Schultz for her outstanding service and enduring contributions to BRIC and all of New York City. Corey Johnson, speaker for the entire council. Laurier Cumbo, Majority Leader, 35th District, and many other members of the City Council. I want to hand it over to our wonderful Majority Leader, who is a brick house herself. <laughs> Thank you. I am just so excited to have you here, Leslie. This is such an incredible celebration of such a dynamic woman who has taken an institution and transformed it into a multi-million dollar state-of-the-art art complex that everyone in the borough of Brooklyn and the city of New York feels welcome. You have created an open door, a town hall space where we can discuss critical topics affecting and impacting Brooklynites and New Yorkers alike, but you're also able to create these amazing, wonderful concerts at Celebrate Brooklyn. We're gonna have Common on June 5th. And we invite everyone to come out and make sure that you see this because Leslie has done something really remarkable. She has recognized and looked at the culture of New York City and has made everyone feel welcome from art exhibitions to performances to gallery openings to town hall discussions to bat mitzvahs to so many incredible things that happen at Brick House. And what I admire about you most is that as a woman to see you do all of this and to go through a very challenging health challenge 
during all of this, but you still held your head high. You continued to push through, and you continued to take this institution to the next level despite your own challenges. And for that, I certainly admire you, and I certainly admire the sacrifice that you've made to take valuable time away from your family and your friends who are here with you today in order to realize this greater vision and dream for all of Brooklyn. Your legacy is going to live on forever. We thank you for the work that you've done, and we're going to have some great retirement lunches and hangouts. And I also want to note that Leslie was instrumental in having utility relief, which is an important program in the city council, that we were able to have baseline because of Leslie's work, and this will provide not-for-profit organizations that um, are on city-owned land will not have to pay utilities and can utilize those valuable resources in order to do programming, staff, salaries, and all sorts of things. So we applaud you for that, for making Brooklyn and the city of New York better. Thank you, Leslie. Let's give it up for Leslie! Here you go, Leslie. I'm kind of speechless, <laughs> um, so luckily I wrote out some remarks. Lori, Majority Leader Cumbo, you blow me away. So thank you, Speaker Johnson. Thank you, Ma Majority Leader Cumbo. Thank you, Council Member Lander. Thank you, Council Member Maisel and, and all the New York City Council for this incredible honor. As you might imagine, it's been an emotional and reflective time for me as I step down from Brick. I hope you know that BRIC has the impact that it has and has become the leading cultural institution that it has only because of this body, only because of the New York City Council. Because of the City Council, BRIC House was built, as Lori said, a welcoming arts and media center in the heart of the Brooklyn Cultural District, which has been visited by nearly 500,000 people since we opened in 2013. Because of the City Council, Initiatives such as the anti-gun violence initiatives, CASA, Sue CASA, digital inclusion. BRIC has vastly been able to expand our education and community engagement programs throughout the borough, including, thanks to Councilmember Lander, lots of programming in the Brooklyn Public Libraries with our media program. Your council initiatives change lives. They are invaluable. Because of the City Council's steadfast and critical support, for, the New York's, for New York City's public access organizations, and this is hugely important, BRIC has been able to amplify community voices around the issues that matter to New Yorkers, including school segregation, mental health as a civil right, and the opioid crisis, and to win numerous New York Emmy Awards. We're going to be back next year. The cable negotiations, the whole relationship between the cable ac access organizations and the cable companies is coming right back up. So. I'm going to be sitting here listening to you guys talk about this. And because of the support from the City Council, Brick has been able to welcome millions of people to the free Brick Celebrate Brooklyn Festival for four decades. This body has been essential to sustaining Brick as a value and service driven arts organization. I owe special thanks and recognition and love to Majority Leader Cumbo. Lori, in my work, I could not have asked for a better partner than you. Thanks to your vision and leadership, which even predates the council, when you were my colleague, when you founded Mokata, and we went to your opening and ribbon cutting in 2005, right when I started, I think. The much needed process of really valuing the arts organization, and as you just mentioned, and gave me credit for, but I don't deserve credit for, challenging conventional wisdom, wisdom about cultural funding in New York City has begun. Utility relief is the beginning of a really new conversation. Your leadership in advocating for more equitable and high impact cultural funding has had unimaginable results. And on top of that, I do treasure our friendship and look forward to those lunches. Thank you all for this honor, Speaker Johnson, for your support and for the joy of getting to know so many of you over the years. Thank you.
Okay, we're gonna get started. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? Quiet on the floor, please. Quiet on the floor, please. At this time, please place all electronic devices, all electronic devices to vibrate. 